Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. Uh, I, I think in that negotiation, I learned the power of walking away. Um, and that's one thing you want the other party to understand about you when you, when you begin a negotiation, that you have the power to walk away. Welcome to Measuring Success Right. My name is Spencer McWilliams, and I'm your host for this episode. Today, we have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Bruce Money about business negotiations and marketing. Dr. Money is the Fred Meyer Professor of Marketing and International Business and Executive Director of the Whitmore Global Management Center at BYU. He teaches courses in global management, international marketing, and global business negotiations in the MBA and executive MBA programs, earning the Outstanding Teacher Award by both his department and the Marriott School. He holds a BA in English at BYU, an MBA from Harvard Business School with honors, and a PhD in marketing from the University of California, Irvine. His research interests include international business-to-business marketing, services, and negotiation. He has also gained eight years of experience in the marketing of financial services. And on top of all of that, Bruce and his wife, Kimberly, are the parents of seven children, including girl boy twins and nine grandchildren, including, again, girl boy twins. Dr. Bruce Money, welcome. We are delighted to have you with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the program. So, Dr. Money, you've had a wide experience in business negotiations throughout your career. Do you have a favorite story or experience from any negotiations you've been a part of or heard of? Well, the world of negotiation is so broad. Um, experts tell us that we uh, negotiate 30 times a day. And um, some of my favorite uh, negotiations are right uh, here in, in, my, in my own life it, it, around, around the house um, with, uh, with teenagers. Uh, sometimes it feels like I'm using up those 30 times a day before eight o'clock in the morning. I mean, uh, let's get up to school, scripture study, prayers. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong <laughs> pursuit of, of, uh, of interesting experiences that I have in, in negotiation. But I, I would um, imagine that uh, some of my favorite stories uh, revolve around some buyer-seller negotiations that I've been involved with. My PhD is in marketing, as you've mentioned graciously. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, you, you learn a lot you know, since, since I'm involved in the buyer-seller piece of negotiating. There, there's lots of different types. There's interpersonal negotiation, as I just mentioned, uh, family with friends, with coworkers, with colleagues, interpersonal influence. That's one world of negotiation. The other is this world of buyer-seller. And, and um, yeah, I have to confess that that uh, not all my negotiations have gone swimmingly, the kind that you can highlight in, you know, negotiation weekly, the success stories. I've, I've had <laughs> plenty of failures where I've, I've realized my mistakes and, and uh, we didn't reach an agreement uh, uh, that was uh, amicable or doable or you know, just kind of blew up. Um, but you learn as much from a failure as you do a success. Uh, but to give you a, a quick story, bought a uh, conversion van in uh, South Carolina for my large family at that time, five children, including the twins. And so needed a large vehicle and and Ford dealership, uh, lots of great vehicles on the lot. The fun part about that negotiation was realizing the power of walking away. I think, I think negotiators all too often uh, don't realize the, the uh, power position that they're in. Um, They think that, Oh, here comes the, the, uh, the recruiter for, our, for uh, you know, P&G or whatever the, the big company is that you're hoping to get hired uh, in. Um, and, and they have so much power and I have no power. Even in a car dealership, you can feel that way. They have the car I want. I, I don't really have any power. You do. And the power of walking away, I left that dealership three times um, at the end of the quarter. And, you know, there's these tricks to trade of uh, when, you, when you're supposed to buy a car. Uh, yeah, that's one of them. And, uh, it was like these, these sales reps were in a, you know, I met the closer, uh, all the, all the uh, tricks they play. I'll, I'll get to the tricks versus, you know, framework in a moment. But, um, it's like, they're hanging on my ankles saying, oh, please don't leave. Please, 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 please. Oh, come on. And I'm it's like swatting them away. This is unprofessional. You don't have to, uh, I, I think in that negotiation, I learned the power of walking away. 
Um, and that's one thing you want the other party to understand about you when you, when you begin a negotiation, that you have the power to walk away. Oh, but what if I don't? What if it's my only offer? Uh, you, do have, you do have an option, and that is to not take that offer. You can you, you know, move on to other, other things, which, um, which, uh, which, will, which will come, right? Um, so uh, negotiating over a car in South Carolina, that was, that was one of my favorite uh, negotiations early in my career where I, where I learned uh, something very important about, uh, about negotiation and the, the, the power of, of, uh, of not doing a deal, right? The uh, power of options. Yeah, I really like that concept of just walking away because you're right. There are moments where you think, oh, like if this is my only option, I don't want to walk away from this. Like, I don't think I'll get another opportunity. But in reality, I think you will receive an opportunity, whether it is from whoever you walk away or something else that may be greater or so. Um, so I think that could be applied to almost anything. I mean, it is great to do it for a car dealership, um, but I think it would be applied to daily life as well. I teach, I teach an elective in, in global business negotiations, and uh, this time of year, near, near and dear to the hearts of all students are job negotiations, right? And I, I just taught a class yeah. on this uh, past week to MBAs. And um, even armed with an MBA from a good school like BYU, students feel like, oh, I, I just don't have any power. I have to to just take the offer. Well, if it is the perfect offer, my advice to students is take it. There's nothing wrong with it. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, and then I do have some students in my office you know, who lay out the perfect offer and I say, is there anything wrong with it? They say, well, no, but I'm supposed to negotiate, aren't I? I mean, isn't that what you teach? And well, yes and no. If it is the perfect offer, go ahead. There is a perfect <laughs> offer on the table. There's something that you need uh, that you can uh, ask for in the right way. Um, and in, in the, the, the power matrix that I call it, you know, needs on one side and alternatives on the other side. If you have, uh, and, and you know, of course, academics can't live without a two by two matrix, but this is a pretty good one. If you have, you know, severe needs, you know, high needs and, and one alternative, okay, then you're in the low power position. If you have uh, six job offers and no student debt, you're in the high power position. You know, students see themselves in the low power position, even if they do have other options. Oh, what if I lose this? You know, my, my job as a negotiations professor, I believe, is to move people up that matrix, see that they do have more power than they think they do. Uh, we, we should never uh, overestimate the pressures and constraints on ourselves and underestimate the pressures and constraints on the other party. So my question to students is, why are they even talking to you? Why are you even in that interview? You are in that interview because you are the future of that organization. They need you more than you realize to fuel the growth of their business, to establish uh, patterns of productivity and, and profitability. I mean, it's a business after all. We create shareholder value. I mean, this is a business school. Um, we learn to do that as, as undergraduate business students and as MBAs um, and as professors, we should be teaching that uh, it, within the consistent values of. Uh, the aims of a BYU education, of course. Uh, but you, you have more power than you think you do, is what I'm saying to students uh, in job negotiations or, or anything else. And, you know, um, if this job offer is, isn't, it doesn't materialize, it's okay. It's, there will be something else. Um, Jimmer for death, the famous uh, BYU basketball player a few years yeah. ago, I heard him interviewed on the radio and they, they asked him, well, what, do you, what do you do for the big game? How, how, do you, how do you prepare yourself for the big game? He said something very interesting. He said, I shrink the moment. What? Aren't you supposed to get psyched <laughs> up? And, and he says, I shrink the moment. This, this isn't life or death. That is, after all, just a game. And um, yeah. the, the, the less I can, the less pressure I put on myself uh, to perform, the better off I do, actually. And I just like that in job negotiations too. There's been, there's been research done on nervousness in negotiation. We're all a little nervous. And the less, uh, what, that you, that you try to, to uh, calm yourself down. Oh, I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm going to calm down. That doesn't work. What works is uh, channeling that anxiety into excitement. This is, this is going to be fun. This is going to be interesting. This is going to be, I'm going to learn something from this interview. Um, and, and it is not life or death. Uh, calm, but, uh, Taking that approach is much more effective than, uh, than trying you know, consciously to calm yourself down. Research shows that doesn't work. 
Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of students need to hear, especially during these times of uncertainty with the pandemic and everything and just the uncertainty that surrounds like jobs and stuff. So I think those are really good techniques that students can apply now and in the future as they are start going into their careers. Um, shifting gears a bit to talk a little bit about your experience with marketing. Um, what we hear when it comes to marketing is that it is all about the customer. And there are a ton of improvements in technology that are continually adjusting how businesses connect with consumers now. What does the future of marketing look like and what are some ways that consumers are changing now? Well, consumers have always been changing and business has to keep up with that. Marketing has to keep up with that. Um, the the uh, marketing and management uh, guru, uh, one, of the, one of the early pioneers of, of management thought, of business thought, uh, his name was Peter Drucker, wrote in the 1950s, when, when business schools were just coming on, onto the scene of, of uh, education. Um, and before that time, you know, there, there weren't really a lot of MBA programs. Um, and, and uh, you know, the early 1900s, which is when the Harvard Business School was, was uh, established, there really was no such thing. And, you know, compared to this, the studies of philosophy and biology, and which are centuries old, business is a fairly recent phenomenon in, in academic terms. So what Peter Drucker said was the sole purpose of business is to create a customer. And, and I'm obviously paraphrasing here, but until somebody sells something, nothing happens in business. So uh, that changes through the decades. And in, in the last year, we've seen a decade worth of change just before our eyes in the, in the, 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 the case of the pandemic. And of course, all areas of business are related. I'm in the, the Department of Marketing and Supply Chain. Well, they're together for a reason. Uh, supply chain, you know, one of the P's of marketing, place, distribution channels, they're connected. And we've seen major disruptions in, in supply chain. And, and uh, marketers have had to adjust to that. And, and, how, and, and also part of place is where customers buy. Is the shift, you know, there's two aspects of that. There's the shift to electronic uh, marketing, uh, the, the Amazons and the, 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 uh, the Alibabas of the world, uh, Alibaba being in China. Um, <clears throat> is that a permanent shift? Yeah. yeah, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I was teaching uh, in the late 90s when MBA students would come up to me and say, you know, you're teaching the wrong degree. It shouldn't be an MBA. It needs to be an EMBA, not executive MBA, but electronic MBA. There will be no more brick and mortar stores <laughs> in the world in 10 yeah. years. And there'll be no more brick and mortar schools in 10 years. There's only going to be one marketing professor. And he or she will come on uh, 10 p.m. after the evening news and the whole world will learn from this one professor. So if it's not you, too bad. Uh, it didn't exactly happen that way, did it? Electronic commerce now is certainly, it has certainly changed the speed at which consumers can gather information, at which they can make transactions. It's hard to try on that sweater, though, uh, over the internet. And there will always be a place where, well, that color doesn't quite match. And return policies play a big you know, uh, part of this. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, to, to answer your question, yes, it has changed and it's changed rapidly. And it's, it's, in some ways, it is a permanent change. They, had the, they said there were two pieces of it. The other piece is where consumers buy, literally. Is it, is it and where they work? Is it in the home, right? And shopping at home is different mm -hmm. than, than shopping over the internet. I mean, you can shop in the internet anywhere, you know, on a, on a bus, on a plane. Uh, but are people going to be just, you know, more used to pulling up the screen, you know, after the, the evening's, uh, you know, dinner and, and so forth, and just, okay, it's time to shop. <clears throat> Yep. <laughs> I had a crystal ball in my, my uh, desk drawer. It sits around here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I would not have to work for a living, but none of us have that. It will, it will continue to change and change rapidly in some cases, in some cases not. Marketers need to be prepared for both. Yeah, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in the next 10 years or so, um, especially with e-commerce. I laughed when you were talking about how, you know, after dinner, it's like, oh, time to shop because you can. You can just bring out your phone and just start shopping and it's grown from, you know, shopping for clothes and especially during the pandemic, you can buy your groceries online and it's just become very accessible. But 
it is true that marketers do have to be prepared for the different changes that are going to come, and I feel like they're going to come pretty fast. Um, Speaking of the pandemic, which we kind of touched on a little bit, um, we all know that COVID-19 has affected just about every industry, for better or for worse. And as students are entering the workforce, what challenges or changes can they expect to face as a result of the pandemic? And what are some examples of how marketers have had to adapt during the pandemic over this past year? Yeah. Well, students are going to have to be as adaptable um, and flexible as the market itself. Students need to go into an organization realizing that uh, they need to be uh, influential and persuasive and effective over a 14-inch diagonal screen. Um, not that they have to be, you know, P.T. Barnum, Barnum and Bailey Circus sales people, you know, uh, but yeah. they, they do have to be effective in, in a different medium. Without a doubt, customers have changed. Without a doubt, clients have changed. Without a doubt, uh, your superiors and your colleagues all do business has changed and has, has changed. Um, and, and, and marketers, marketers, and my, my field is global marketing, uh, have, have had to change. Uh, how, how, and as consumers, we've had to adapt a bit. Um, my dishwasher went out this summer. One, another one, uh, everything in my kitchen is stainless. It's kind of the, the uh, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the popular, um, finishes in, in homes these days. So I needed another stainless dishwasher. My wife and I went down to uh, Lowe's, um, looked around, uh, called, and we've, we've looked around, you know, socially distanced and, you know, just a few people in the store at a time that, you know, that there's one big adjustment there, foot traffic, which drives retail, which is the, the, the heartbeat yeah. of, of consumer behavior in that setting. You can't let them in the store or the restaurant. Anyway, um, want a stainless. No, uh, you can have this black one. Lovely. Well, yeah, it's oh. black, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> not, it doesn't match the other. Um, you can have the black one today. Or how about this white one? This white one's great, too. You can have that one today. It's sitting back there in the warehouse. Stainless, you have to wait six weeks. Oh, my oh, god! I've got dishes in the sink. Okay, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, I washed a lot of dishes because we needed to match the finishes yeah. of, you know, we did those by hand. Sorry, um, cream corn. Example on the other extreme, you can't find any cream corn. Wall Street Journal does some really fun articles about supply <laughs> chain. Why can't anyone find any cream corn? Well, the, the harvest cycles of corn tip and tip, are of necessity of a certain time cycle and of a certain uh, supply chain that is constrained by when you can get it into the can. Well, for one, there's a shortage of cans. And for two, there's a shortage of logistics that get the corn into the cans and production, and et cetera, et cetera. So forget it on, on cream corn uh, in cans that you're going to, oh, well, how does that affect my life? Not dramatically, but it's, it's a signal. It, it's, it's, a, it's an artifact of the pandemic of how, well, you know, none of that. Odd-sized paper cups. You know, I can't find any or the, the, the uh, sexual selection of, of soft drinks in the, in the store. There's... One week, a ton of Diet Coke. Next week, there's none. <laughs> you know, uh, I've never seen this as a consumer, but I think in the pandemic and maybe in times to come, we'll, we'll need to see more flexibility, not less. And since we've already been through it, 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 shouldn't, it shouldn't be surprising. Yeah, the stores are very interesting even now, like just a year after the pandemic. It's just really hard to find some stuff even now. So I always thought that was interesting. Okay, Dr. Money, last but not least, our podcast is called Measuring Success Right. And whether we know it or not, we're all looking for success in our lives. It's super important to choose the right metrics for determining our success, which is why we like to ask all of our guests how they measure their own personal success. So, Dr. Money, our last question for today is, how do you measure success? Well, I I think I I would measure um, success personally along the lines of happiness. Um, how happy are you and how happy have you made others around you? Those, those are highly correlated uh, it, and um, yeah. a lot of science and, and, uh, and religion behind, uh, that very, uh, concept. Um, and there's all these, these, uh, like the world happiness index and, and, you know, every, every so often a popular business periodical or another or time magazine 
runs a, a happiness index uh, for the world and see where people are most happy and least happy. It's always surprising uh, where the, those, those uh, the spikes in happiness are, places you would least expect it. Money doesn't buy happiness. Uh, it's certainly past a certain point, even, even in the United States uh, or other developed economies. Uh, past a certain salary amount, the effect of money is negligible on happiness. So yeah. what, what, brings that, what brings that happiness? Um, a Harvard School professor who, for the last case, introduced uh, the case of Lee Smith, fictitious business school student. And it went uh, on to talk about his job search. And Lee um, uh, got an offer from prestigious consulting firm and so on and so forth. And uh, the professor plucks another gray hair from his scalp. And this is the 238th visit <laughs> this uh, this semester from a student in my office. And, um, only two have been about uh, you know, substantive long range career and life issues. Uh, others have been about money. And uh, <laughs> he philosophizes <laughs> and, and, and talks about um, the pursuit of happiness. And, and he, he, and I, I, I don't have this case in front of me, I believe I can pretty much quote this. He says, um, I have found that there is very low correlation between uh, short-term, uh, even long-term income and happiness. And this, this is his closing statement. Happiness is associated with enthusiasm. And I think that so well uh, portrays, as a business professor, what I tell my students, um, your happiness of both kinds is important. If you only have happiness of one kind or the other, um, that, that's hard. And um, I'm paraphrasing uh, President David O. McKay, who said, uh, and I'll, I'll expand his, this is back in the 60s, uh, I believe it was in a, in a, in a priesthood meeting, but I, it, it applies equally to, to both genders, and I'll, I'll paraphrase along those lines. Uh, what's the list of things that should be your priorities? Uh, number one is your spouse. Uh, number mm-hmm. two, your children. Number three is your job. Number four is your church calling. Now, this is President McKay, not me speaking. And um, notice the position, the relative position, spouse above children, uh, job above church calling. Because if you're not effective, and happiness is part of that, in, in your employment or your, your underemployed or uh, unemployed or your, your, your job life just isn't going well, you're not going to be very effective uh, as an instrument in the hands of, of, uh, of the Lord. In, in accomplishing his work, but I'll uh, I'll conclude with with this, um, Spencer. That uh, I get a lot of worried students in my office and in my classroom who just it's not going to work. I'm not. How can I be happy when I'm so stressed <laughs> out? I mean, particularly in the pandemic, am I going to get a, a Zoom job or any job? I will tell you this, Spencer. After 25 years of teaching thousands of students. And particularly here at BYU, where I just, I just love, I love the faith-based nature of our lens on, on all this. Uh, is, is it possible to be, to be immersed in the, the light of the gospel in a business school? I, it, I think it is. And it, it, mm-hmm. when I was interviewed to be an NBA professor, the director of the program said, you know, you think you're teaching marketing or international business or negotiations. You're teaching the gospel. Classroom, you have, you have a uh, separation of church and state, which, you know, founding fathers. Et cetera, it's not a bad thing, but uh, I said, how do I, how do, I do that? Uh, coming from a big state school where that wasn't really allowed. He says, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, he was right. You know, there's natural uh, actions of yeah. gospel. But I'll, I'll leave with this. Um, if a sparrow falls not to the ground, Spencer, without our Heavenly Father's notice, who and I are not going to be left alone at critical junctures of life. And there's a long list of jobs that I wanted so bad and, and so many things that I wished had happened to me that didn't. At the time, mm-hmm. I was crestfallen. And was, oh, you know, the current Bush is one of my favorite articles. Hugh B. Brown told that story. Uh, you can look it up uh, in, in the church library. Uh, God is the gardener, and he knows what's best for us. Uh, and yeah. it, it seemed at the time a, a, a harsh uh, punishment. But it's really for our, our, all things shall work together for your good. 
as it says in Doctrine mm-hmm. and Covenants 90, 24, one of my favorite scriptures, if ye walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted one with another. We're all in this together. Uh, if, you, if, if you do uh, search diligently, pray things, all things work together for your good. Not some things, not all things just on Tuesdays and Thursdays, all things that work together for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, all things. I do believe that. I love that. Well, Dr. Money, thank you so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate your insights and all the things that you shared with us. I truly do think that this is what students need to hear and what can really help them go through these stressful times of being a college student because it is really hard. But like you said, it's not life or death. It, it's error like Michael, or not Michael, Jimmer for debt, like he quoted in the quote that you said, he just shrinks the moment. And um, I think we could all use that, especially now. But thank you all for listening. This is Spencer McWilliams with Measuring Success Right. Have a wonderful week. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. Be a friend and tell a friend about Measuring Success Right. This podcast is a project of the Marriott Student Review at Brigham Young University. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Marriott Student Review or online at MarriottStudentReview.org. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Brigham Young University or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.